All right, we're back. Thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, you'll be able to join us in the chat if you have comments or questions as we go through this tonight. This is a really special show. This is not specifically about Beyond Vaudeville, but it is linked to Beyond Vaudeville because uh, it is all about a show that really was one of the main inspirations for Beyond Vaudeville. So I think you're really gonna enjoy this tonight. Um, it's, it's, it's really special. So. We're going to be looking at the Roy Radin vaudeville shows. Now, Roy Radin, um, he was born 1949. He was murdered in 1983 at the young age of 33. And it was known as the Cotton Club murder, which you may or may not have heard about or remember. Um, it's all covered in this book, Bad Company by Steve Wick. Um, if you want to know about that whole horrible, ugly side of the story, it's all in there. We're not going to be focusing on that tonight. What we're going to be focusing on are the vaudeville shows that Roy Radin produced during his lifetime. And um, Roy Radin, his dad was a, a big player uh, on Broadway and he managed a store club like in the 1920s and 30s. And he eventually, um, his son, Roy, um, decided he wanted to go into showbiz too. He grew up in it with his dad. Uh, he uh, joined the circus at age 16, and uh, by 1970, as a teenager, he was already producing these vaudeville shows. I came across it myself as a teenager, going to this show at the Calderon Concert Hall in Hempstead. Uh, I think I went because Tiny Tim was in the show, and boy, was I blown away by this. It just, uh, I, I'm going to call, I'm just going to call up the program so you can see and uh uh yeah so it was barbara mcnair uh pinky lee um it, it had uh, jan murray it had john carradine reading edgar Allan poe poetry i mean it was just uh mind-blowing all these acts on one show um and uh so i'm now going to introduce two of the guys who were there for a lot of it. And they actually weren't there for that show. I think they, they had left by 81. Uh, but man, they were in a lot of the shows. And just like any uh, guys in a band, uh, they are really fun to talk to. They've got great stories about all these people. Um, and I am, uh, I think I just had a sneak preview of one of the guys there. <laughs> um, and, uh, but yeah, without further ado, let's welcome uh, Tim Fowler, who headed up the band for these great uh, vaudeville shows, and Jerry uh, Barrett, who uh, was uh, playing trumpet for the band. And uh, guys, here we are. Here we are. <laughs> so I, you know, I just went very quickly over Roy Radin and what these shows were, because I am really frustrated by the fact that I can't find a lot about these shows online. And it's crazy because you guys had so much talent involved in these shows. And I, any idea why there isn't more known about these shows, why there isn't more video of all these shows? Uh, primarily it was because they just didn't publicize it enough. They, they were police benefits, believe it or not. And we did them all over the country. And that's how, how they made their money. But um, I think it's because they were benefit shows, they didn't treat them like big productions. 
Although when they saw what we were doing, they were floored and the reviews were usually great. And uh, now, Tim, you um, headed up the band and uh, Jerry, I'm right. You were playing trumpet, right? That's correct. Yeah. OK. Yeah, Jerry was one of the lead trumpet players. And you guys and the whole band, you came from uh, Berkeley School of Music, right? Correct. That's where we met. Tim and I met at Berkeley, and uh, he called me one day and said, you want to go on the road? I said, sure, why not? And that's where it began. Sweet. And Well, I'm going to call up the uh, – let me call back up um, the program that I had there. And um, – here we go. Uh, so what I did was I put together a lot of pictures from the programs over the years. And um, I thought that would be a good way for us to kind of get into the acts that were there. Um, and uh, let's just start off with a shot of the most important people in these shows, uh, the band. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you guys, how many pieces were in this band? Uh, we had about 12 pieces and in these pictures this was the one on the right is obviously we're getting ready but yep. we're just waiting and the one on the left is when we were doing one of the shows and that was me conducting and uh, i had read somewhere uh that um at one point uh, one of the band guys fell off the stage and it might have been that 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 setup you had on the right there yeah exactly oh, yeah. <laughs> so what what exactly happened that night Go ahead, Jerry. That was you. <laughs> yeah, that was that was me. There was a there was a kid to my right, and the rest of the section, the other two guys were to my left. And you see those transoms behind us. They were all individual. Uh, there must have been one, two, three, four, five, five or six of them behind there. Yep. And they're all weighted down at the bottom. Well, there was no lip on the back of that riser, which I don't know. It's probably about a three foot riser or so. And uh, during George Goebbels' act, we had to stand up and bow to him. He had this little routine. He'd turn around, bow to the band, we'd bow back and sit right back down again. That's usually how it went, except this night, the kid to my right, his chair slipped off the back. And thank goodness those, those transoms were there, or whatever they're called, reflectors, because he didn't fall straight to the ground and, and get hurt. He slowly fell back, but he couldn't stop himself. So the first thing he did was reach out for me, and I'm looking at him, and all of a sudden he's knocking me off. Well, the next thing I do is I reach for Dave Kennedy, who's sitting to my left. And by this time, the fourth trumpet player saw what was going on, and he said, I'm, I'm not being part of this, and he moves out of the way. The three of us start falling down, and the transoms were, were like this behind us, and they're starting to go like this, which now they're hanging over top of the trombone section. <laughs> well, the trombones turn around by this point because they hear all the noise behind them, and they see this thing coming down at them. Well, they get all panicky, and they you could see they were getting ready to run, and we're falling down in slow motion with this thing being pushed out. George Goebel turns around and he just starts cracking up. He just starts laughing. And by that time, the, the transom went like this, went back and forth because of the weight on the bottom. We were laying on the ground <clears throat> laughing like crazy because we knew we weren't going to be hurt now. And uh, the whole audience went nuts. They thought it was part of the act, but it wasn't. <laughs> and uh, that's the that's the story of George Goebel. And he made... <laughs> and crack jokes about that for the next 20 minutes, about how we almost lost the trumpet section. That was, uh, that was it. Well, we're going to have more about George, um, and, and uh, he'll be coming up in one of these shows. This was the earliest one I could find. This was from uh, 1970, uh, obviously before you guys came on board. You guys came on board around what year? 73, I believe. 73, okay. But, um, so it may this have been 72. Okay, and this right around there. so this was 1970, one, a, a really early show that Roy Radin was doing with his traveling vaudeville show. He had J. Fred Muggs, uh, the chimp from uh, the Today Show, 
who I believe uh, there are reports that he's still alive at age 71 down in uh, Florida. <laughs> uh, there was a guy on here. I saw uh, Billy Bach, the world's smallest saxophonist. Did you guys know him at all? No. <laughs> no, never heard of him. Yeah. And George Jessel, who, again, Roy Radin's dad, uh, you know, knew uh, George. So George became the early big celebrity star in, in a lot of these early shows. Um, and uh, and you guys got to know Jessel pretty well. Very well. And Tim, there was some story about uh, Donald O'Connor, who used to be in the show's he was in the hotel and he walked by uh, Jessel's hotel room and saw Jessel laying naked <laughs> on the bed. Yeah. What was he that saw, all about? He saw Georgie's door partially open. So he walked over and opened the door and looked in and there's Georgie laying bare naked on this on the bed with his USO cap on. <laughs> and Donald said, Georgie, what are you doing? Why why you know you want me to close the door? He said, no, no, that's how I get lucky. Every once in a while, a maid comes in and I get lucky. <laughs> we said, okay. <laughs> wow. The thought of seeing a, uh, a naked, older George Jessel laying on the bed. It's amazing Donald O'Connor was able to, to to keep going on the road after that. Yeah, It was not a pretty sight, no. <laughs> be scarred for life. <laughs> now there's Jessel. And, and who's he standing with here? With Jerry. Me. That's Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, Jerry, you got along well with uh, Georgie Jessel? Uh, he was a nice guy. He really was. He uh, had a lot of stories. He was known as the Toastmaster General of the United States, and he uh -huh. wouldn't let you forget that. And uh, whenever we'd walk into a restaurant, he'd always had this big booming voice, and he let everybody in the restaurant know that he was the Toastmaster General of the United States. <laughs> I don't know whether he expected people to get up and rise or what, but he was a funny guy. He always did it with a laugh. He would also get up in the morning, get on the bus, and he'd have a little glass of milk. And we thought, well, that's nice. He's having a glass of milk. And then he'd take out a, a bottle, a little flask, and pour, pour his booze in there. And then that's what he drank. It was, uh, it was uh, whatever booze he was drinking plus milk. I mean, it had to be tough for some of these old timers. Like you guys were doing 42 one nighters, 42 cities and 42 days. I mean, it, all traveling by the bus. It, it had to be tough for some of these older guys like him. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was very hard on them. But they uh, but, but they, they did it. That wasn't these, easy. these guys are all vaudeville guys. So they were troopers. And and uh, and with a little help from the milk, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now. With, yep. And now another guy that was uh, listed on that 1970 show was uh, Kenny Sherburn. Oh, yeah. um, and uh, there's Kenny, uh, who was uh, really a very um, accomplished uh, juggler. Um, but there was a story uh, that I think, uh, Jerry, you had said something about um, him uh, going on stage after having a lot of tequila. Yeah. Yeah, he... Uh... It's our first night in the band, and we had a small band in those days. We went out with about five, uh, five or six pieces. <clears throat> so we were in the pit. Now we're viewing everything from the audience's point of view, except we had to look up really far. Well, Kenny does his act, and he juggles his axes and all his pinballs, and... Um, he gets on his unicycles and he comes to the edge of the stage to do a stylization. He, well, where they hold their arms out and wait for you to applaud. <laughs> so he gets to the edge of the stage on this little two foot unicycle and jumps off. And the whole band kind of jumps back because they thought, where's he going to go? He's at the edge of the stage. The wheel of the unicycle has kicked off the edge of the stage. And we thought he was going to fall into the pit, and everybody you could just see him jump a little bit. It's the first night. So he goes ahead, goes, continues his act, goes through another unicycle that does the same thing off of this, I don't know, four-foot unicycle at this point. So we're getting a little bit more nervous, and the drummer has to watch him constantly in order to catch all the little kicks. You know, 
and he ain't beating on the drums. <laughs> and uh, anyhow, all of a sudden, he gets on this unicycle that's six foot tall. Now, he's got a four feet besides that. So his head is above the curtains at the top of the stage, and he's juggling axes. <laughs> well, 20 minutes before the show started, I was in the men's room, and I heard this <laughs> coming out of one of the stalls. Uh, I thought, what the heck is that? Now, this is the first night in the show. <laughs> um, holy cow. So I'm washing my hands and stuff, and all of a sudden, Kenny comes out of the bathroom, comes out of this stall. He's in there retching, throwing up, carrying on. His hair is all messed up. He can barely walk straight. Now he's on his six-foot six unicycle, and we're scared to death because <laughs> I know how drunk he is. Well, I had said something to the rest of the band before we even started, so that's one of the reasons they were so nervous. Well, the drummer, Jamie was his name. I don't remember his last name. The drummer's watching him catching all these kicks and everything. And, and all of a sudden, Kenny's on a six-foot unicycle and kicks it out from underneath of him. It looks like he's jumping into the pit. Jamie gets up and runs up the aisle because he thought he was going to get hit by the unicycle and his falling juggler. But he never did. He never dropped anything. He always looked sharp. He looked like a different person when he was on stage. The minute he got off stage, that was it. Roar. And he's back to even his cookies again. It's amazing because it, it did seem like there was plenty of drinking <laughs> going on with, uh, and and we'll mm. get to some other stories too. But um, but in the at the end, uh, these were all like real uh, established pros who were used to doing lots of shows, and and oh, yeah. the show kept going on. Um, there's some questions in chat about. Uh, were these national tours or specific to New York City? Uh, and there are some answers by people uh, in the chat as well that they were, uh, they did tour nationally, but mostly East Coast. Is that right, guys? Uh, no, we went all the way out to the Midwest. Okay. We went out as far as Minot, North Dakota. Oh, wow. And uh, all the way down, all the way down to Florida and Atlanta. And then up, we did a couple of shows up in Canada. But primarily, it was uh, New York, the whole the whole East Coast area, out and, to uh, out to Ohio, uh, Lisa, all, all Lisa, over Pennsylvania. Lisa and Peter Cohen are saying Hawaii. Oh yeah, but I was the only one of the band that went on the Hawaii trip. That must have been a hell of a bus ride. <laughs> Where? Actually, we it was one of the first trip we did. It was horrible. We flew to from uh, we did uh, Miami, Reno, Salt Lake City, and Honolulu. And when we got to Honolulu, we had three days off before the show, and uh, our luggage didn't show up. We had forty nine pieces of luggage, and all forty nine disappeared. <laughs> and what happened was the airline, uh, I think it was Eastern Airlines. Uh -huh. Lost uh, no, it was United. Lost all our luggage, and it turns out it was sitting on a runway in Guam. <laughs> and they finally found it, sent it back. But when we got it, all our clothes were soaking wet because there'd been a monsoon. <laughs> so we all did our, our our show, whatever you bought in the store just before the show. Wow. Yeah, it just yeah, seems it was, like a constant refrain of the show must go on with these shows. Oh, it was. Oh. I mean, we, we never missed a show. <laughs> Even if we had to push the bus in a snowstorm, we did it. <laughs> That's just the way it was. So here, uh, this is 1971. Uh, we've got Jessel again, and now we've got Tiny Tim, who had a long-standing relationship with Roy Radin, and, and Roy was producing him and managing him and releasing some of his uh, music. And... Um, uh, I got to ask you guys about Tiny Tim. He's, you know, he's behind me on the wall here. He was, uh, uh, he was beloved in our Beyond Vaudeville shows. Um, I, as, as band members, I'm really curious to hear what it was like backing him up because it seemed like Tiny would just sort of stream of conscious go into whatever song he wanted in his medley. Was that the case? No, he actually had a, a set act that we did. Ah, okay. But, um, Tiny was... An interesting character. 
he was he was one of those guys that you could ask him, okay, in the third inning of a game in New York, the Yankees versus Chicago, uh, the third inning, uh, what happened to the second batter? And he could tell you. <laughs> and he was, I mean, and any music, you ask him a song, he could tell you who wrote it, who first recorded it, who had the hit, and what years those happened. He was just amazing. He had an incredible memory, but he couldn't cross the street by himself. <laughs> well, yes, he uh, tiny definitely had his eccentricities. And and Tim, uh, what was the story on the on the bus with the uh, the Bible and Jackie Vernon, the comic? <laughs> oh, God. oh, yeah, that was really interesting. OK, it was about four o'clock in the morning. We stopped at a truck stop. Everybody got off, went to the bathroom, got back on the bus. And as I was walking by Tiny when I made sure everybody was on, he's he always called us by our last names. And as I walked on the bus, he says, oh, Mr. Fowler, uh, you seem to be a man of the world. Can we talk? And I kind of went, uh-oh, <laughs> where are we going with this one? So he sat down and he started telling me all about his sex life, which was very bizarre. Wow. But that he, to control himself, he carried a Bible and had all these photos of like just totally out of control gonorrhea. Wow. And frightening, frightening pictures. And Jackie Vernon was sitting in the seat behind us, reached over, grabbed the Bible, and started flipping through it and looking at all this stuff. And then got a hold of a tiny shopping bag that he always carried with him. <laughs> and some of the stuff in there was just totally off the wall. <laughs> but that was wow. that was he but he carried those pictures to make sure he stayed celibate wow what a so he'd flip so he'd be reading his bible passages and looking at horrible photos of gonorrhea and um wow exactly uh, <laughs> and this is how he this is how he stayed out of trouble <laughs> um some of the other acts from this uh this edition in 71 there was uh count scalzo it said see him burn a woman alive uh, Berger's Animal Review, the world's only box boxing Afghans. Um, I, I, I don't think you worked with those, uh, you guys, right? Nope, we, we missed that one. All right, all right. Well, we're catching up to your years. Nope. We're getting there. <laughs> 72, uh, this was a show. Um, if you see at the top of this, it says the Hagerstown Firefighters. Um, and I think, um, Tim, you were alluding to this earlier that these shows were uh, typically um, sponsored by uh, uh, a local uh, police group or firefighter group or a school. Um, and uh, it was very creative funding at one point. Um, <laughs> at one point, the operation was kind of uh, investigated by the New York Attorney General. But but uh, I don't think anything came of that. Um, but, yeah, these programs would just be filled with advertising from like local uh, retailers and and it would all be designed as a, a way to raise money for the for the local uh, police group and and uh, um, yeah so I, that's a, it's a little aside from what you guys worked on with the show but uh, I thought that was interesting and, and and as you see these come up with all the police and fire uh, men mentioned at the top of the ads that's why um, yeah, this, that's what that was. Yeah, now this was an interesting show. This was 72 with Cab Calloway, the new Kingston trio, Alan Sherman, the Hello Mudda, Hello Fada. I, I can't yep. believe he was doing a show in 72 like that. Um, but again, I don't, you guys didn't uh, work with these guys, right, in these shows? No, we came on right after that. Yeah, okay. So let's, uh, let's keep moving on. So 73... This looked like uh, a heck of a show. Um, and so Red Buttons was in this one. Um, yeah. And uh, Tim, you had, um, what What were your impressions of Red Buttons? Red Buttons could be a really nice guy. He didn't associate with us much. He rode in a limo and we were all on the bus. And he was actually the one of the only stars that didn't travel on the bus. Okay. Um, but like I said, he was a very nice guy. He was very funny. You know, he had his whole, uh, never had a, never had a dinner right. routine. 
So, uh, but he was great to work with. Yeah. And, uh, and he ended up uh, doing a, a eulogy at Roy's funeral many years later. Um, and, uh, and, and, oh, oh, Tim, but you, uh, what was uh, your encounter with him in the uh, hotel? Oh, <laughs> Jerry, I'm sure you'll remember this. It was our, our very first tour. And we were in a, in Hampton. No, it was a, in New Hampshire. And uh, it was a Holiday Inn, and Jerry and I were having a little fun throwing water balloons out the window onto the Winnebago that Roy's guards were in. <laughs> and then we started a water balloon fight up on, on our floor. And uh, at that point, I was running around in my underwear, and somebody came by with a luggage cart, so I jumped on it, and they shoved me down the hall. And as we're going, I'm going flying down the hall, all of a sudden a door opens and there's red buttons. He just watched me go by and just kind of went <laughs> and closed the door. Didn't say a word. <laughs> how, how old were you guys when you were doing these? Well, let's see, that was 73. I would have been 22. Wow. So you're just like guys in your young 20s just having a, a party and but but also playing your music. It, it must have been a ball. Oh, it was. It was fabulous. Indeed. This was my first tour. Jerry was an old road rat by then, but this, <laughs> for me, was my first tour. Now, also in this show was the legendary Frank Fontaine, Frankie. Crazy yep. Guggenheim, right? Yeah. And, uh, and Jerry, that's you with him? Yeah, that's me. I, I'm not sure how some of these pictures got uh, taken, but that's me. <laughs> He was now, a great guy. He, he really was. was. And, uh, but he actually ended up having a heart attack on the bus on the tour, right? Yes. Well, that, that would have happened after, after I left. I, I, I'm not sure what year I left. It was around 77, 76, something like that. And uh, he continued, uh, both Tim and... Uh, Crazy continued on with the with those tours, and uh, that's when he was getting ill. He was he was on a downslide at that particular point. Yeah, I was on that tour. Yeah, but you, I was working with Donald O'Connor, and uh, Donald was the headliner. But Roy booked Donald for two nights in Atlantic City, so they pulled me off this show to go to Atlantic City with Donald. And when we got back, we heard that Frankie had a heart attack, and they pulled over and had the had an ambulance come out right away, and they took him off. And I think we had like three weeks left of that tour, and the last week Frankie actually came back out. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So he survived the heart attack and came back, and but he he wasn't long for this world after that. <laughs> No, after that, what happened, he went to do a show, I think, in Seattle or someplace like that, doing a, a telethon. Yeah. And uh, he really liked the, the cause. So after he finished, he walked off stage. They handed him his check. He walked back out and handed it to whoever the star of the show was and said, here, you guys keep this for the cause. Walked off stage and dropped dead. Wow. Now, when he was doing uh, your live shows, uh, he would do both the serious singing and Crazy Guggenheim? Oh, yeah. He had a gorgeous voice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Funny story about... Yep. Funny story about Frank was that uh, after the show was over, he never drank before the show, ever, ever. Mm -hmm. And he'd do the show, and he was fabulous, and never told a blue joke, just, just a funny, funny guy. And of course, when he'd get serious and sing, everybody sat up and listened. Well, after the show, he'd go back to the hotel, go to the bar, and there would be a, a group playing there at the bar, usually a rock and roll group, who never heard of Frankie Fontaine. And uh, he'd go up to them, and after he had a few snorts, then he'd say, I'd like to sing a song. And they'd say, yeah, okay, what do you want to sing? And he'd say, well... Um, my Wild Irish Rose. Of course, they didn't know it. But he'd sing a few bars, and the guys most of the time would pick up on what the chords were. 
So he began to sing with a terrific voice of his. Now, he was not a singer. What I mean by that was he wasn't trained. And there were many nights on the show that we had to jump ahead a measure or behind a measure in order to stay where Frank thought he was. But that was okay. It didn't make any difference. He good singer. Well, he'd get up there and sing with his rock and roll band, and he'd do, I don't know, six choruses of the same song, <laughs> and they'd try and bring it to the, to the end. They'd be playing the guitars, and they would get towards the end of the tune, and so they'd be playing the 2-5-1 to end the, end the song, and Frank wouldn't take the hint. <laughs> Frank would just start another course. He'd be up there for 14 choruses singing until Joanne Worley or somebody from the band would <laughs> run up and say, Frank, this is the last one. And he'd go, oh, okay. And he'd sing and finally bring the whole thing to an end. <laughs> and he'd go back onto his bar stool, get drunk as a skunk, fall off his bar stool, and we'd have to go over and take a blanket. And we'd roll him into the blanket and four or five of us would grab a corner of the blanket, lift it up, and carry him back to his room. So he, <laughs> he, he would never know how he got there. He just, I woke up in my room, and then we'd start the whole day over again. It was the same thing. Wow. But he was a funny, 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 nice guy. Nice guy. Uh, now, this, is, uh, this was 1973. The thing that was weird about this one is it, it said the fifth annual, which would have meant the show started in 68, but I don't, I don't see any other record of uh, Roy starting these shows as early as 68, but maybe he did. It could uh, have. They were just smaller. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, this one had Louis Nye. So there were a lot of these guys. Some of them just seemed to be like one and done. Um, uh, and uh, unless, you know, unless he showed up again and I just didn't see him in any ads, but, um, were there some performers that were just like, you know what, this just isn't for me, this, this doing this on the road at this age, at this stage. Yeah, that was Eddie Fisher. Eddie Fisher felt that way. Okay. He did. He did one tour. And then, uh, the second one we started and he got through about a week of it and said, that's it. I'm done. Yep. Yep. Uh, but that was that was more the way everybody was being treated at that point. Got it. OK. And then uh, this was 1973. This was uh, an odd thing. Uh, it looked like uh, Roy was producing some show at the Nassau Coliseum, a folk show. Um, and um, uh, Kingston Trio, Oscar Brand and Carolyn Hester. Um, did you guys know anything about this project? No, nope, we came in after that. OK. Got it. Okay. Uh, and here is, uh, so now we've got a show with a great uh, lineup. We have Ken Sherburn, who we talked about earlier, uh, George Jessel, the Ink Spots, Frank Fontaine, Tiny Tim, George Goble, the Blue Streaks, <laughs> Frank Gorshin. Wow. Um, that was a great show. Yeah. Wow. So George uh, Goble, we, we touched on him before. Let's talk a little more about George. Uh, George went on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, and <laughs> and I guess Johnny asked him about Roy Radin, and George said, "quote Roy Radin knows as much about show business as a pig knows about church on Sunday." Yep, that's what he said. <laughs> now I did saw that show that night. Very funny. <laughs> the funny thing about that was George called me. I was living in L.A. at that point, and George called me and said, "Hey, watch the show tonight." And I said, "Okay." So now I saw him say that, and all of a sudden that was they they went to black and, and uh, went to commercial, and uh, Johnny Carson said, "Oh man, you're going to get sued." Then Freddie de Cordova came over and said, "George, you're you're going to get sued for that one." And then uh, the attorneys that were offset came on and said, "George, you're you going to have a big problem." George said, "I don't care." The next morning, his phone rang. And it's Roy Radin. And Roy said, hey, George, thanks for the mention. That was really great. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't care. He thought it was hysterical. Any publicity is good publicity, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Tim, um, uh, George had an expression that he, would, uh, that he would use with you guys where he would kind of come up to you and say, the wind is blowing. Yep. 
And what did that mean when he would say the wind is blowing? Well, George was a heavy drinker, but uh, he was he was never a mean drunk ever. But he'd come up and his he had an equilibrium problem anyway. The more he drank, the worse it got. So if it got really bad and he started feeling like he was staggering, he'd come up to Greg, Zach, or myself, or or somebody else, but ma- mainly to Greg and myself, and he'd say, "Hey Tim, the wind's blowing." I'd say, "Okay." And I'd take him and we'd walk him out to the bus and we'd get on, get him on the bus and sit him down. And then we'd go back to whatever this party was that we were at for all the police officials and city dignitaries after our show. And uh, the funny one night we did that and he came up and he said, hey, the wind's really blowing. <laughs> and so Greg and I were walking him out and I saw it rained while we were inside. And there was a big puddle right in front of the steps of the bus. As we got closer, I looked, I said, George, looks like it rained. Watch, watch that puddle. He said, why? What's it going to do? <laughs> Just <laughs> killed us. Oh, man, we almost dropped him. And was there, uh, now, was it George Gomel that you were telling me that there was one time when uh, he had a, a drink and you guys were helping him get into the bed or something? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep. He had a cup, a glass that was filled all the way to the top. And if he budged at all, it would spill. And he did not spill a drink ever. So now we're walking him. Greg had him by one arm. I had him by the other. We walk him to his room. We open the door, take him in, and go to sit him on his bed. And Greg thought I had him. I thought he had him. We were both lowering him down, so we both let go. He hit the bed, bounced up, rolled off the bed, rolled onto the floor. And the whole time he's doing this thing, moving his hand around, and he ends up not spilling a drop. <laughs> so Greg Greg took the glass and then the two of us picked George up, put him back on the on the bed. Greg handed him his drink and George says, Hey Tim, sit down. So I sat down next to him. Of course I was a little bigger than he was when I hit the bed. Of course the bed dipped and he did one of these things and went sideways and I ended up wearing his drink. <laughs> it was one of those nights on the road. What can I tell you? <laughs> uh, now, here's a show. This is 1974. And uh, again, you know, a great lineup here. And then we're seeing uh, Frank Gorshin, the Riddler, a great comic, impressionist. Um, and he, uh, I think maybe you mentioned earlier, Tim. So Frank Gorshin did not ride in the bus with everybody. No, Frank had a car. Okay, okay. And... Who else didn't ride in the bus? From what I could tell, uh, Pinky Lee had said that uh, Zippy the Chimp traveled in a Cadillac. Uh, well, Joe, I would imagine, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> probably good for you guys that you didn't have a chimp in the bus with you. Well, we uh, never had the chimp with us. Uh, Joe Frazier rode in a big red Cadillac. Joe uh, actually rode on the bus with us. Oh, he did? Okay. Yeah, he did. Uh, we may have and, uh, one of the later shows after I left... He may have done that, but no, he loved being on the bus. Okay. And DeMond Wilson rode in Roy's limo. Yeah. Roy, he and Roy were very close, but DeMond again came on, I think the year after I left. Later. Okay. And then Eddie Fisher also, he, he didn't ride in the bus. No, he had a, he had a limo. Okay. Yep. Uh, and, uh, here's just some more shows from right around that time. And, uh, and it was at, at the Tamament. The Tamament, was that uh, one of the Catskills? Yeah, that was Hotel in the Catskills. Yep. Hmm. Oh, that was Louise, Louise O'Brien was on that hmm. show, and it turns out that her fiancé owned it. Ah, okay. And w- were there any other uh, Catskills venues that you guys played? or? I think that's the only one I remember. Okay. Uh, and... Uh, also showing up on these shows uh, was um, Paul Winchell, um, whose name actually was misspelled in this ad, I noticed. But um, I did you guys work in any of the shows that Paul Winchell did? No. Okay. okay. No, I didn't. No, we did. We loved working with Frank Gorshin, though. He was great. Yeah. Yeah. He I was noticed you, you haven't said anything about the sex symbol from East McKee's Port, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Yeah, the first show Jerry and I did, we really had no idea what we were getting into. We got picked up um, in Boston at Berkeley. We all met there and got into 
there was a like a, a Bronco, a fossil, the first day, and we're playing through his stuff, and all of a sudden we hear this strange female voice going, making you know, go, ah, 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 making weird sounds, and of course we recognize the voice immediately because it was Joan, uh, Joanne Worley from Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In. Ah. <laughs> but we had Joanne, we had uh, Donna Jean Young, who, which was her partner on Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In, who, as Jerry said, was known as the sex symbol of East McKeesport, Pennsylvania. <laughs> and she was an absolute doll. Well, Joanne Worley is still going strong. Uh, she still makes appearances out here in Los Angeles. And uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, um, she was a sweetheart. Uh, now this was 1975. Uh, we've got Joey Fay. He was uh, on one of our beyond vaudeville episodes. I think he was another one of the guys that just maybe did one of these shows. Um, and now, was this, was this the one in, uh, um, uh, in New Jersey, Paramus, New Jersey? Uh, might be, I don't, I'm not seeing, uh, where was Pat Suzuki, Georgie Jessel. Playhouse on the Mall, it looks like it's called? Yeah, in Paramus, New Jersey. Okay. That was, Roy actually called me. He got in a fight with Buddy Freed, who was Frank Gorsh's conductor, who took over conducting the whole show after Mickey stopped. And uh, then he and Buddy got in a fight. So Roy called me up and said, hey, Tim, can you conduct the show? Or can you conduct? And I said, yeah. <laughs> so he said, well, I got a show in, in uh, New Jersey for a month. Why don't you come out and see how it goes? And if you do it well, if things go well, then you take over conducting the big show. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. So I went down and it was, it was a blast. I had a ball and the shows went really well. Uh -huh. And after that, that's when Roy came to me and said, Hey, I think it was the second week said, well, you got the big show. And I said, all right. So I moved from being in the sax section to conducting. Oh, sweet. Okay. Yeah. And uh, and Lisa and Peter Cohen, I guess this must have been someone from the band, maybe because uh... oh, Peter Peter Cohen actually was the production manager, road manager for the show, and he handled all the production uh, for a month on one show, and then the next he went back as Eddie Fisher's road manager. Okay, he's mentioning in the chat in the chat that uh, after the shows we had to wait while Joe Frazier would jog behind the bus. Yeah. <laughs> Occasionally, yeah. He had to burn burn off some uh some uh energy that he had. Now, also in this 1975 show, we see the Harmonica Rascals who were continuing to the show right up to the one I went to in 81. Yeah. Um this was uh maybe the original incarnation of the Harmonica Rascals, but um uh Eventually, this was the guy in the uh, in the little guy role. This was uh, Bobby Purcell. Bobby Purcell, yeah, yeah. And uh, Greg Zach, another guy in the band who uh, really wanted to join us tonight, but uh, had another commitment. Unfortunately, he was telling me that one time he can remember on the bus that uh, Bobby um, actually, uh, you know, the bus was so always so jammed with all the luggage and and, and all the acts and everybody. And that Bobby found himself a place on the luggage rack where he was yeah. uh, decided he was going to sleep. And uh, he said on a bad turn, Bobby rolled off the luggage rack down <laughs> onto the floor. And uh, he, said, he said Bobby got up and, and just was like, oh, man, I'm seeing stars. You know, so, uh, any memories you guys have, have of Bobby? It was funny. He uh -huh. was. He was a very funny guy. Very funny guy. Very funny guy. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, I don't have a lot of stories about the Harmonico Rascals. They were good. They did their routine. Um, they were an interesting group. Uh, and Bobby was the funny one out of, out of all of them. He, uh, he clowned around all the time. He, and what was the what was the guy he hung around with from the Harmonico Rascals, Tim? I don't remember his uh, name. Bruce, he was, Bruce? he was, I can't think of his last name. Yeah, he was the I, son of, he was the son of the old guy that looked kind of like Curly <laughs> in the Harmonica yeah, no. Rascals. <laughs> I just, I yeah, remember I in their I act. Remember. That, I do know they were popular. I, I, I remember in, in their act that, uh, that Bobby would play the giant harmonica and, 
that they would have a guy, yeah. uh, one guy on each end of him, uh, each end of the holding up the harmonica while he would kind of like uh, go down, up and down. Back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the whole the whole act was sight gags. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that would have been one of them. Now, and the other thing is when he'd back up, somebody'd have their knee bouncing while they're playing. Uh -huh. And Bobby would back up and back up into the knee and start bouncing like this. <laughs> and then turn around and look at him like, what are you doing? Now, Tim, you said that Bobby was actually quite the uh, ladies' man on the road. That he was. That <laughs> he was. In fact, uh, at least twice a tour, we'd have to stop at a, we'd have to, the bus driver would take Bobby to a store so he could buy some clothes because his pants kept disappearing. He'd, take a woman back to his hotel room, he'd wake up in the morning, she'd be gone, and so would a pair of his pants. <laughs> and this so, was, I guess, their way of showing that, that she got to sleep with a, with a, little, a little person. Wow, taking Bobby's pants as a, as a trophy. It was pretty strange, yeah. <laughs> so this, uh, I've got a couple of pictures here from 76, and I, you know, as I go through these photos, it seems like 76 really was kind of a... a a, a choice year for these shows um, in terms of the talent and everything just seemed to really be kicking in. And it, this must've been such a heady time for you guys to be, uh, to be traveling with the show. Uh, well, Jerry, Jerry and I both look at it working with Milton Burl mm -hmm. was just a dream. I mean, we lo we all learned so much about show business and about professionalism from Milton. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he was amazing. And Donald O'Connor, who you're showing right now, this, and, this was after a bad night. We were walking out to the bus, and I think, Jerry, didn't you take this picture? Probably. I took yeah. a lot of pictures, but not enough. Yeah, but anyway, and, yeah. Donald and Tim, you was, ended up doing, uh, you ended up uh, working with Donald O'Connor even outside of these shows, something like 30 years, right? For 30 years, I was his conductor, yep. Wow. Wow. I was with him for 30 years, with Eddie Fisher for eight years. And Eddie Mecca, from the time he came on, I think he came on in 76, until he passed away in 2002, uh, two, 2022. Eddie Mecca, the great ragu from... Uh, the, the big ragu Laverne from Shirley. Laverne and Shirley, yep. <laughs> yeah. uh, now, Greg was telling me a story about Donald O'Connor, that they were on the bus and... Uh, Donald O'Connor sat down next to him and was introducing himself and whatever. And, and, uh, and he asked Greg about the smoky stuff. And, uh, <laughs> and Greg was like, uh, well, I guess, you know, you kind of heard my reputation for uh, enjoying the smoky stuff. So he said they went to the uh, bathroom in the bus and uh, had some of the smoky stuff. And uh, and that after that, um, Donald just uh, got the munchies really bad um, and, and couldn't stop pulling from the uh, munchies. I guess you guys had stuff in the back of the bus. Uh, oh, yeah. Food. And yeah. Um, so was there was there much in the way of weed and mar marijuana on these on these tours? Uh, there were a couple of guys, but primarily it was a pretty straight pretty straight group yeah they, they were all drinkers i mean we had uh a couple of coolers in the back of the bus filled with beer and it was always a poker game in the back of the bus those and, were legendary yeah they <laughs> were <laughs> and tim you had told a story in uh justin martell's biography on tiny tim about uh i guess donald would do a kind of a, a funny thing where he would pretend he was going to hit hit a guy in the crotch or something yeah and Tiny got really upset about this? Uh, yeah. Tiny didn't think it was very funny. Because uh -huh. Donald would walk up to you and say, take a bow and reach down and act like he's going to slug you in the nuts. And uh, <laughs> everybody would laugh. I mean, it was an infantile thing, but it was funny. <laughs> but that was back when Donald was drinking. Yeah. And um, here we were. Um, we were all sitting on stage playing the show. And we hear... Donald uh, says, Tiny, take a bow. And you hear, Mr. O'Connor, you're such a big star. You shouldn't be doing things like that. <laughs> and he says, oh, I'm sorry, Tiny. Take a bow. And all of a sudden we hear, cut that shit out. <laughs> and that was Tiny. 
All of a sudden, his voice dropped like two octaves. And with <laughs> the whole show, everybody went, to see what the heck that was. It's hard to imagine that coming out of Chinese mouth. but uh, it was. I, and I never heard it again. <laughs> <laughs> he pushed the button. <laughs> yeah. And, and who's Donald with here? Danny and the Juniors. Ah, uh, okay. At the Hop and Rock and Roll is here to stay. Yep, yep. Okay. Yeah, they were fun to work with. We loved working with them. And this was, uh, okay, so there, and then, yeah, there we've got Burl again, and Bur this Burl headlining. And, uh, yeah, so let's talk a little more about uh, Milton Burl. So he, um, uh, uh, actually, Greg was telling me that uh, uh, there was a show up in Town, Pennsylvania, and um, Milton Burl gets up there, and there are these uh, really old stagehands there, and Milton knew them all by name from the his yeah. earlier years touring in, in the in the 40s and whenever this was. Yeah, both he and Donald O'Connor knew all the old stagehands. Crazy. Yeah. Because yeah, they both, I mean, Donald started in show business in on in vaudeville with the O'Connor family, which was the royal family of vaudeville. And uh he was <laughs> only a year old. He in fact he came out on stage when he could first walk, and it was a funny bit. They didn't know he got away from whoever was supposed to be watching him. And all of a sudden, Donald came wandering out on stage. And the drummer saw him and saw him because he was just a little bitty kid. And he started like looking like he was going to fall down. So the drummer's doing a drum roll. And all of a sudden, Donald butt hits the ground and guy goes, <laughs> so, <laughs> and that was Donald's beginning. But yeah, Milton was amazing. Milton so let me, Burl let me tell you. Would, get, would get to the theater four hours before we had to go on. And he had a hand in everything, everything. It didn't make any difference what it was. He had a little script that he would give the script to uh, uh, the spotlight guy, the electrician, whatever. And he'd arrange all the lights. He'd say, I want this over here, what the, where well, you'd walk into a theater. And of course there weren't that many guys necessarily at all these little rinky dink places. So he'd drag out a ladder, climb up the ladder, and start to adjust the light himself. <laughs> well, all of a sudden, the electrician wakes up and sees that he's up there. He says, you can't do that. You have to have a union card. He whips out his wallet, pulls out an electrician's union card, and says, I can do any damn thing I want, and, puts <laughs> and adjusted the light. And Milton did that a lot with a lot of different places. I had more respect for him. You either loved Milton or you hated him, but I had a lot of respect for the guy. He knew what he was doing. He knew every every nuance, every little, everything he did on stage, he had a reason for doing. Yep. It's funny he because uh, when he did, um, when he hosted Saturday Night Live, it was kind of legendary that, you know, there was just a real clash there because they... Mm -hmm didn't like him coming in and kind of, you know, running the show. Um, but it sounds like for you guys, you really respected him and it, and it, uh, you appreciated what he was bringing. Yeah. We had well, heard that Milton was very difficult to work with. And it turns out he was, he was a sweetheart. He just expected you to do your job as best you possibly can. And all he wanted was perfection. And that was the way he worked, and he expected everybody else to work the same way. And Jerry, you were with us when he took us out to dinner, weren't you? Yeah, absolutely. You were on that. Yeah, all of a sudden, Paul Daffelmere, who was Milton's um, Ballet. manager, came up to me just at the end of the show and said, when, when we get to the hotel, keep the guys on the bus, tell them, go dump their stuff, get back on the bus. And I said, why? What's going on? He said, don't worry about it. Just do it. I said, okay. So I tell everybody when we stopped, I got up and I said, all right, all guys on the band stay on the bus. And they figure, oh, man, we did something wrong. <laughs> and um, I said, go drum, dump all your stuff in your room and get back on the bus right away. So we did. And we took off and went to a restaurant. And it was a really nice restaurant. And when we got there, Paul was waiting for us. We got off the bus and they walked us through this hotel. Or, I mean, this restaurant to a private room and it was all set up for the band and it was just the band and milton and paul and he said all right guys 
you guys are the only true professionals on this show. Everybody else is just walking through it. You guys are great every single night. And I want you tonight to sit down. If you want to have a beer, don't just have a, a beer. Have an imported beer. <laughs> if you see a, if you want uh, an appetizer and you see two of them that you like, don't just get one, get both. And get whatever you want on the menu. You want lobster, get two lobster tails. He said, don't worry about a thing. And we said, awesome. So we had a great party all on Milton. Wow. And he was just saying thank you to us for the job that we'd been doing. I said to him, I sat next to him that night, and I said, what the hell is escargot? I had no idea. <laughs> Milton said, two orders of escargot over here. I had no idea they were snails. No idea whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, there was a show that uh, I, I, it might have been on this tour where you guys were playing in uh, Buffalo and there was like a blizzard and there were about 34 people showed up in the audience. Yep. And Burl still wanted to do the show. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. If, we did show, it, if the audience shows up, you do the show. We did it in Maine in the middle of the summer with the uh, uh, all the beaches filled and all that kind of stuff. Nobody's going to come to a show on a Sunday afternoon. We had five people in the audience. Wow. Five people. That was it. Normally it was packed. Yep. As, as a yep. matter of fact, we played a place in Fargo, North Dakota. There's nothing around. We took a, a, a flight to Fargo in a DC-3 or something. <laughs> and you'd look down there and all it is is fields. That's all you saw. Yep. Cornfields. Roads would cross here and there. And you thought, where are the people coming from? And we got to the theater. It was the most gorgeous theater you'd ever want to see. It was beautiful. The acoustics were fabulous. Well, every night you'd look outside before the show starts, see how many people are in the audience. I peeked out through the curtain. The place was packed. I don't know where these people came from. It's like they lived underground or something because there were no houses or anything. <laughs> So it went from one to an extreme to another. But every night, no matter how many people there were, Burl always put on a show that was exactly the same as the one the night before. There could have been 15,000 people the night before and two the following night. Same show, same energy, same everything. <laughs> now, would, yeah. he, would Burl ride on the bus? Um, yeah. Well, yeah, he rode on the bus, yeah. 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 He, uh, <clears throat> Now I see also on this uh, on this uh, 1976 show that uh, Godfrey Cambridge was there, and this is probably Godfrey has one of the most legendary stories um, uh, on the tour um, about uh, breaking a rule on the bus. Correct? Yeah, he did. Oh yeah. Yep. <laughs> oh yeah. You want to? Either of you guys too? want to tell that story? Well. As cleanly as possible. Okay, I get it. Yep. <laughs> you go uh, ahead. We, we had a rule that you don't do number two on the bus because we had a bathroom. Were, you know. Yeah. So Godfrey went back to the bathroom, and we thought he was going to do like everybody else. Instead, all of a sudden, from the back of the bus, you hear a couple of the guys in the van go, "Oh my god!" <laughs> and they're opening windows and moving forward. We ended up, it was so bad that I think there were only four rows on the bus that had people in it. And all the windows all the way back were open and it was in a blizzard. <laughs> so we had snow coming in the windows. The bus driver had to take the bus after we, after we finished that show and take it out and have it cleaned. We had to have it cleaned twice to finally get the smell out. It was off. <laughs> But yeah, that was one rule: you do not drop an axe on the bus. And 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 uh, it was very clear why that was a rule once that uh, happened. Uh, oh so, yeah, that's so for this sure. is uh, this is around that time, and here's uh, Roy is just uh, riding high at this point. This is uh, you know he's he's got Burl on one side, right, and and uh, it's um, Dorothy Jessel on the other. And Jessel, yeah, and uh, and yeah, it just uh, it it seems like. Roy knew everything was just clicking into place at this point. You guys were 
were doing more than you were doing like more shows at that time? Yeah. Yeah. We'd gone to like three shows a year. Hmm. Plus he had a couple of smaller ones and uh, he had a bunch of other stuff going at that point. He was, uh, I think he was producing Van McCoy. I wish Greg was here. He could tell you. That's yeah. Greg Zach right next to uh, Roy, his wife on one side and you know, Roy's wife, Loretta on the one side and Greg Zach on the other. Mm-hmm. And Greg was my Barry Sax player for up until he went to work for Roy and became a uh, vice president of the company. Wow. But he could tell you all of the stories. And then this is just, uh, you know, we just put together. Um, uh, Roy was also uh managing acts and producing acts i mentioned earlier tiny tim um, yeah. uh, but it looked like he was trying to get this uh dick sean show together and uh some of the acts he was representing judd strunk and um he was producing some music as well trying to get into that whole world yeah. um so all this was happening kind of simultaneously with the traveling vaudeville shows yeah yeah, yeah he stopped coming out he used to go out every show Mm-hmm. And then he started not coming out. He'd come out for a few days from time to time. And there at the very end, he only came out like two or three days out of the entire show. Wow. Uh, he was just so busy with his other projects. Mm-hmm. And at that point, Greg Zach had moved on to running, helping Roy run the office and, and handle all the acts. Mm-hmm. And, and I was sorry to lose him, but uh, it was a good move for him. And there was, uh, there's a question in the chat from Dennis Devine. How were the singers from the big band era, like the Ink Spots, Dick Hames, et cetera, what was it like working with those people? Fabulous. Mm-hmm. Like across Very the board, good. all this, because there were a lot of singing groups, right? Yeah, Dick Hames was just amazing. Johnny Ray was incredible. Mm-hmm. And Jerry, you have any stories about Dick? The only thing I can say about Dick is I didn't know of Dick before we did the shows. And Buddy Freed was uh, the conductor at the time, and he passed out the music and said, these charts are are good charts, but pay attention. And we started (laughs) to play the charts. Just doing the intros, I knew right away that this guy either sings or had great writers, period. And uh, we started the intro. Band sounded good right from the beginning. And uh, then Dick began to sing. And it was like Sinatra was standing there. Hmm. Different style, but the same kind of tenor uh, voice, the same kind of or baritone. And he was just a delight to work for. But unfortunately, like so many of them, uh, they were into drinking a lot. And that was the th- thing that, that hurt Dick Hames. He was um, he was too heavy into the bottle. And uh, But I think he could have been as big as Sinatra. Uh, and, and, of course, he took over for Sinatra on, uh, oh, what band was it? On, um, I think it was the Tommy Dorsey band. Oh, right, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> And uh, uh, yeah, because Sinatra started with the Pied Pipers and the, right. uh, the Dorsey, and yeah, um, yeah, it's uh, it, it definitely seems to be a common thread with uh, unfortunately, with a lot of these uh, older performers that there, the, the, there was a lot of drinking from, from the stories you guys have told. A lot yeah. of drinking, yeah, yeah. Well, Dick, Dick was a class act, oh, yeah. without a doubt, absolutely. And uh, this was the uh, Raiden Mansion. Um, so, uh, did, you guys, did, did you guys spend any time out there in the Hamptons at this at the this mansion? Yep. Uh, in fact, we had that. Were you with us on that uh, Thanksgiving show? Yeah, absolutely. We, yeah, Roy had you and I got there late, and and Loretta gave us a tour of the mansion. And we had gone through a hundred rooms and finally said, we're, we're, we're tired of going through these rooms. Let's just go enjoy uh, the party that was going on. (laughs) But he had a, he had a, um, uh, like a turret that was just the boiler room between his office and the main part of the, of the house. Mm -hmm. And he owned what, about a mile or two of beach front. Yeah. The beach. In fact, I took that picture of the house. Yeah, and uh, I was standing out right at the edge of the water. 
wow. looking back at the house, and this was one of three wings on the house. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, wow. that's only a portion of it. Yeah. Uh, now this is uh, so. Now we're up to 1977, uh, and uh, one of the acts here is Jackie Vernon. Uh, and Tim, you uh, you were telling me something about uh, Vernon and uh, Eddie Mecca. Eddie so Mecca. About that, about that <laughs> Oh god, yeah. Uh, we were in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, and uh, there was a. a little shopping center across the street from the hotel and Eddie and I were walking down to, to the restaurant to have lunch and Jackie says, Hey guys, come on, let's go over there first. So we went walking over to the, to this little shopping center and there's a drugstore uh, souvenir shop there. And so Eddie and Jackie and I are just walking up and down the aisles, looking to see what's there. And Jackie kept bumping into Eddie and Eddie kind of look at him and move a little bit. And this went on all the way through the store until he finally bumped into Eddie once. And Eddie said, hey, you know, back up a little bit. You keep bumping into me. He said, oh, I'm so sorry. And so now we're getting, we leave the store. We get back to the hotel. He says, Eddie, come to my room for a minute. So we go to the room. And as we get to his room, he starts reaching into Eddie's pockets and pulling all this stuff out. Jackie had been shoplifting through the whole store wow. and putting stuff in, in Mecca's pockets. <laughs> it's just, but yeah, he was a character. He had a thing about luggage that was nobody knew about. He, Carl, the bus driver, would tell me, hey, Jackie just bought a bunch more luggage, so I got to go to uh, UPS and have it shipped back to his house. And about three times a tour, Jackie would go out and see a luggage sale and buy all this luggage and ship it back. His house, his garage was filled with never used luggage. <laughs> it was a, quite a character. Now, how um, now your last con I don't know if it was your last contact with him, but he had called you from Roy Radin's gravesite. <laughs> oh, God. oh, should we really talk about this? Well, I mean, yeah, if it's, I call, I'll, I'll well, tell you first, what, if it's a true story, yes, let's talk it about is, it. It is absolutely what the what the Lord knows, as George Goble would say. <laughs> um, I got a call from Jackie that afternoon of the funeral, and he said, hey, I'm back here at, at Roy's funeral. And I said, I didn't know you were going to go. He said, yeah. Uh, he says, it's going to be the most attended funeral ever. You know why? And I said, why? He said, because when you give an audience what they want, they show up. I said, oh, man, that's cold. So wow. now I got to call at midnight, 9 o'clock. I was in L.A., 9 o'clock, my phone rings, and it's Jackie Vernon again. And I said, Jackie, what are you doing? He said, well, you know, I went to the funeral, went to the party after, and everybody's hanging out. And now I decided it's time, it's time to go back and show my respect to Roy's grave. He says, I got to pee on the grave. Wow. I said, Amazing. you got to be kidding. He, he hated him that much. Yeah, but he it, kept working for him because he needed the work. You know, it's something with these. It, it really seemed like it, it's very complicated and very hard to understand uh, Roy Radin as uh, as a personality because it seemed like there was a great side of him and a, and a real love for him, and, and then there was another side of him that where yeah, where you hear stories like that uh, from from Vernon. Um, yeah. He was hard to work for sometimes, not all the time. Well, yeah, if you a lot of the there, time he was a good guy, but uh, there at the were beginning moments. Yeah, at the beginning when we first started working, he was a ball to work for. He was he had so much fun, and we every show was a party. I mean, it was amazing. We had a great time. Couldn't wait to come back and do it again. And the last few shows, uh, his whole personality had changed. And he became very difficult to work with. Mm -hmm. well, One of the reasons I left was because Roy was getting a little weird. Um, an example of that was we had all these bodyguards with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were off-duty narcs from, from Connecticut. And uh, all of a sudden, we get a knock at the door at 3 o'clock in the morning at our hotel room. It's the manager telling us to get out. 
I said, why? You know, I know the band went to bed early because we were really tired from the night before. So they couldn't have done anything. Right. He said, well, it's it, ask your boss. So we did a little digging to find out that Roy and the bodyguards were throwing the pool furniture into the pool. Wow. Well, well that's not a big deal because that's how they wash the furniture anyhow. Huh. Yeah, but you don't shoot at it with a forty-five before it hits the bottom of the of the pool, and that's what was was going on. Now, and, and Roy could turn like that. He he really could. Nice one second, a real jerk the second. Unfortunately, he's, he was a good guy, but there were moments that Roy had. And they, there's a lot obviously chronicled in the in the book I showed at the top of this. And and again, I, you know, we're not going to go deep into Roy's issues, sure. but but there yeah. were. Lots of accounts of, of unfortunately cocaine abuse and uh, um, yeah and yeah. Uh, uh, and it's a shame because these shows were you know really doing well and they they could have just kept growing and and continuing you would think yeah yeah but um, he wanted to he wanted to get out of it and get into into other things which is why he went to Hollywood yeah. yeah. In the movies, yep. And uh, okay, so <clears throat> let's get back to the talent. Um, <laughs> uh, it's an odd transition to Billy Barty, uh, who uh, everybody loves. Um, this is Billy Barty uh, doing his uh, Liberace impression, which he had been doing for for years. He was, he's another guy that was like a child performer, right? Uh, yeah. He, yep. in fact, he and Donald O'Connor were best friends. Wow. Yeah. When they were when they were uh, young actors into into their teen years. And then they remained friends all those years. Yeah. And uh, and here he is with uh, Stanley Myron Handelman, um, who's kind of a forgotten comic now. Do you guys remember uh, any stories about him? Or Oh, yeah. Yeah. Stanley was, I was gone by then. Stanley oh. was great. He had a joke. He was he the, his problem on this show was he was too hip for the room. Uh huh. He was a very funny comic, but you had to get his humor. But he killed the band. We were constantly laughing. But he came out one night and he, he said, I got a poem. And he says, my dog is dying by inches and dying by inches is hard. So I took him out on the back porch and let him die by the yard. <laughs> we fell down. We thought it was the funniest thing we ever heard. And the audience just kind of gone, huh? <laughs> so, that was that was Stanley. He was he was so funny, though. Yeah. Well, and, and like you said, if he was too hip for the room, because I did read somewhere where Roy had this, um, there was some anecdote somewhere I read about how he had such a great sense of what audiences would like and, you know, knew that they would really appreciate a good animal act. And, you know, and, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And there's a comment uh, from Kate uh, Kozanowski. I'm, I'm, is that Roy's sister? That's Roy's sister, Katie. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Hi, hey, Kate. Katie. Yeah, hi Kate. Thanks for tuning in here. Uh, Kate wrote that there were no drugs until much later after his divorce. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and uh, Tom Smith writes, "I saw Stanley Myron on one of the last Sullivan shows, and he was hilarious. His persona was very similar to Woody Allen in the stand-up." Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, okay, this is 1977. Uh, now we have an appearance by Forrest Tucker from F Troop. Um, I never thought of Forrest Tr Tucker as I always thought of him as an actor. What what was he doing in the show? He he sang and act, and uh, sang and told jokes. Mm -hmm. He was an old vaudevillian. Uh huh. Okay. And he was great. He was a sweetheart of a guy. We all loved him. And uh, and Henny Youngman showed up. I'm surprised Henny Youngman didn't do more of these. Uh, I don't know why, because he yeah. was very funny. He was so fast <laughs> and just had the audience in stitches. He was great. <laughs> and, he was the original guy that if he opened a refrigerator door, he'd do 10 minutes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and also in this show, we had uh, Alan and Rossi, but uh, not Marty Allen, but Bernie Allen. Bernie Allen, yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, and Bernie was still he was a funny guy, too. There's Bernie in drag with Donald O'Connor. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, any uh, do you know if people were showing up expecting Marty Allen? Probably. 
<laughs> or maybe they didn't even know the difference watching them. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah it could be. Uh, and then we had uh, Gloria DeHaven in a very <laughs> special outfit here. What was the story here? Do you remember this? Were you on this one, Jerry? No, I didn't do this one. Oh, it was hysterical. The first night she came out in this dress, I was standing in front of the band and getting ready for her to start into her first song. And I realized none of the guys in the band are looking at me. I went, hey, hey, guys. And all of a sudden, one of them locks his eyes on me. And I said, what's going on? And he just kind of nodded back toward Gloria. I turned around and looked. And as, the, as you can see in the picture, when the spotlight hit her dress, the de dress kind of disappeared. You just see the silhouette. And these guys couldn't keep their eyes off her. <laughs> so then I had to really rag on him to get him to pay attention. <laughs> now I walked up to Gloria after the show and I said, hey, Gloria, you know, I, I don't know how to tell you, but that dress that you're wearing is is when the spotlight hits you from the front, you can see through it. And the guys in the band, I'm having trouble getting them to pay attention. And she says, well, do they like it? I said, are you kidding? They love it. She says, I'll wear it every night then. <laughs> I mean, she was a doll. She was one of the sweetest people ever and a gorgeous <laughs> voice. Yeah. Now let's talk about at the opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, if she were the sweetest, we've got Jack Carter. Oh, yeah. So let's talk about let's talk about Jack Carter. Uh, so uh, Jack Carter did an interview late in life with uh, Cliff Nesteroff, where he was uh, um, Carter was saying that when he was doing the shows with Jessel, they basically ran out of the show uh, together uh, during a particularly grueling uh, run in Pennsylvania, and they uh, they escaped and left the show and quit on the show. Um, what do you guys remember about Jack Carter? You want to take this one, Jerry? Well, I only worked with him once. I wasn't on the show. You and I went to uh, New York one time, left from Boston. And we went out there, and Dick Sean was on one night, and Jack Carter was on the, the following night for whatever show we were doing. And uh, he wasn't a nice guy then. Um, thank goodness he didn't have much music to, that we had to play. Uh, so you're going to have to thank it, Tim, because I wasn't – on those road shows that we did. Yeah, well, the main thing about Jack Carter, I mean, everybody loved riding on the bus because it was a big family and we had a ball. Jack Carter is the only one that was ever thrown off the bus. <laughs> we couldn't stand him. He was a miserable person, not to speak ill of the dead, but hey, he was. He was just an awful person. And we finally talked Roy into letting him ride with Danny Rapp. Now, Danny Rapp from Danny and the Juniors drove his own car because Danny didn't like getting up early and riding on the bus, so he'd get up when he wanted to and he'd show up for the show. So we talked Jack into driving with Danny because Danny was a very heavy drinker and we didn't want him to get arrested for DUI so Danny could sit and drink in the car while Jack drove because he loved driving and we made him think it was his idea. <laughs> but we got him off the bus and he never came on again. And that was his last tour with us. And was it just that he was just very negative? He would just say negative was, things about everything or he was just mean. Hmm. He was mm -hmm. just mean and had nothing. He was miserable. Yeah. And, and you guys, you actually had a nickname for him, right? Captain rage. Captain Rage. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and which is, you know, it, and, you know, I, I know you, you said you don't want to speak ill of the dead because you really, uh, he's, he's the only guy where all of a sudden you hit a speed bump. It's like everyone else, you guys have such fond memories of everybody. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And just, uh, but Jack Carter was one of the exceptions. <laughs> he was the exception. I don't remember anybody that we all universally hated. <laughs> Uh, Tom Smith says in chat, I heard that Jack Carter once got cut on the Sullivan show and started griping at the other performers as he left who didn't get cut. Well, yeah, I guess that probably would be in keeping with character. Yeah. Uh, here we go. This is 1978. Um, so here's uh, Eddie Fisher. We talked about earlier and, and Tim, you worked with him uh, a number of years, even outside of the shows, right? Yeah. 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 In fact, at, right after one of the tours, uh, Eddie's manager came up and said, hey, Eddie's got a date right after this. Would you want to go? And I said, sure. What is it? And he says, well, we're playing in uh, Wisconsin uh, for a week. 
And I said, okay. And that was all they said. And then told me when to get on a plane. I flew in, met them. We all went out in the limo. And as we're on our way out, I said, oh, by the way, where are we going? And they said, we're going to the Playboy Resort in, in uh, Wisconsin. And I said, you're kidding. And he said, no. I said, wait, now I'm going to go work for a week at the Playboy Resort in Wisconsin on a beautiful, uh, Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, that's where it was, uh-huh. right on the lake. And you guys are paying me to do this? I mean, I was a young kid. I was like, whoa, this is awesome. <laughs> and it turns out it was Eddie Fisher's birthday <laughs> in the middle of this run. So that night of his birthday, they had a, a dinner for us before the show, which was a mistake. Everybody drank quite a bit. Then we went out to do the show. And Eddie started talking about the fact that it's his 50th birthday. And he turned around and looked at me and said, hey, Tim, how old are you? And I said, I just turned 25. He said, 25, wow. He said, do you have any idea how much fun I had when I was 25? <laughs> do you have any idea how much fun I was having when I was 25? I said, yeah. He said, what do you mean, yeah? I said, I heard about it. He said, what do you mean you heard about it? I said, your mother told me about it. <laughs> he chased me off the stage trying to hit me with a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, Peter Cohen saying in chat, I took that picture. Well, well, okay, yeah, that might have come yep. from uh, our Facebook page that we have for the old shows. Uh, and uh, let's see now here. Uh, also, uh, oh, you know what? Let me just Spoken go back. Joe Frazier, yeah. Yeah, before Joe Frazier, there was a story about Ronnie Spector uh, <laughs> and Eddie Fisher's shoe. What happened there? Yeah. All right, yeah, Ronnie had like everybody else on the show at that point had a drinking problem. Mm -hmm. She got totally plastered this one night and it was a small theater with only a couple of dressing rooms. So Eddie and Donald O'Connor shared a dressing room and all of a sudden Ronnie came walking in staggering and she walked over and she looked around, ended up just puking her guts out. And unfortunately it was right into one of Eddie Fisher's shoes. (laughs) So he had to go rinse his shoes out and then wear a wet shoe to go out on a stage. <laughs> that was something else. <laughs> All right. Here's uh, here's Joe Frazier. So um, now, was it you, Tim, that had to go in and tell Joe Frazier something? There was some awkward encounter with him, right, early on? Yeah, early on, yeah, because his arrangements were all messed up. Okay. And we went and we rehearsed. Everybody else, we blow through them. Because these guys could read like crazy. I mean, they're great players. Oh. And uh, all of a sudden, after the first show, things didn't go well. Because it was, you had to go back, re- repeat this section three times, jump back to here, read to here, jump over to here, go back to here. I mean, it was all over the place. It was like a roadmap that went nowhere. So I went to Roy. And Roy said, hey, you guys got to rehearse again tomorrow and get Joe's act together. I said, no, Joe needs to rewrite his arrangements. These are terrible. So he said, well, you go talk to Joe. So I went and I knocked on the door. And at this point, I was a young guy and I was really pissed because my guys were working great. And I knocked on the door. I said, you know, just started yelling at him about his terrible arrangements and all that. (laughs) And all of a sudden, his big hand comes down on my shoulder and he just kind of squeezed a little bit. He says, calm down and come on in. And he dragged me into the room. And says, here, have a piece of candy. And I'm still fuming, but I was looking at this guy who knocked out Muhammad Ali and broke his his jaw. I said, I got to be out of my mind. Can't fight this guy. So I went, okay, thanks. And we sat down. He said, what do we need to do? I said, these need to be rewritten. He said, well, can you do it? And I said, sure. He said, okay, go ahead. I'll pay you. So I stayed up all night fixing the parts that had to be fixed. And we went on the next night and everything went great. Wow. Wow. So just a big pussycat. Yeah, but he and I got along great. <laughs> From that point on, we got along really well. You're now, talking about Joe Frazier. There's there's one nut nut story, in it, and it's not Joe. <laughs> and what was that? Ahead. It's all yours, Sherry. Yeah, it, it, it was you, Tim. What do you mean going in there? Oh, Very yeah. angry. 
I was fit to be tied. <laughs> I understand why, but it's Joe Frazier, you know? Well, I finally realized that when I'm looking at him and he puts that big mitt on my shoulder and gave me a squeeze. <laughs> yeah, but he was such a nice, nice man. Yeah. In uh, fact, there was a thing in Hawaii. I don't know if I should tell this story. Um, we were sitting at a bar, and it was Joe and myself and his manager, Andy, and a couple other guys. And uh, so we were sitting there, and all of a sudden, this gorgeous blonde comes over and sits down next to Joe and starts talking to him. And uh, all of a sudden, this big Texan comes out with a big cowboy hat and the belt buckle and comes over and walks up to Joe and says, hey, and taps his shoulder. And Joe just kind of froze. And Andy, his road manager, who is also a huge guy, froze and he says hey hey what are you doing talking to this woman and i just slowly got up off my bar stool and walked up to this guy and he was half you know another half of my size and i'm looking up at him like this and he's i said i don't think you want to do that he said well what are you going to do about it i said well you know what i'm going to do i'm going to save your life he says what do you mean you're going to save my life how are you going to do that? I said, you ever hear of smoking Joe Frazier, former heavyweight champion of the world? He says, yeah. I said, Joe, say hi to the man. Joe turns around with a big grin on his face and goes, hi. And the guy goes, oh, Mr. Frazier, <laughs> nice to meet you. Uh, 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 and he and this whole table booked out the door. <laughs> but it, was, it was one of the more bizarre evenings, that's for sure. <laughs> All right. Now, this is uh, 1978. Tiny Tim is on the road uh, with the show. He does an interview and he starts trashing the, the show. Cavalcade of has-beens. He called it a cavalcade of has-beens. So yep. how was he received uh, the next day on the bus? Well, everybody was pretty pissed. And uh, he was he didn't realize how bad that was. But he got on the bus and he was in tears. He apologized to everybody. He said he didn't mean to do that. And it came out wrong. And everybody went, okay. Yeah, that, that was it. Because we all loved him. He was a very sweet man. But, uh, yeah, that, I don't know that did not go over well. I don't know if Joe Frazier was on that tour, but I hope uh, he was uh, okay with that as well. Yeah. Uh, this is 79. So by this point, you guys are both off the show, right? Yeah, I had left then. Okay, yeah, so going, yeah. yeah, so uh, did you uh, did you guys perform with uh, with Sherman Hemsley, um, uh, Barbara McNair, Dennis? I did Day. with Barbara. You did with Barbara. She was on yeah. an earlier show. Yeah. Okay. Just a, a short bit down in in Miami. Yeah. Now, um, in on the uh, Facebook page that we have set up, uh, Vin D'Onofrio had posted something that Barbara once had uh, uh, on the bus had flashed at a, a truck driver on the turnpike. No, that was uh, Gloria to Haven. Oh, unless, okay. unless Barbara McNair did that also. Uh, and, uh, and he also had written that she would jump in the hotel pool uh, uh, in the buff with everybody. Like I said, we weren't on that tour, so we don't know about that. You guys left too soon. Yeah, yeah, apparently. I'm beginning to think so, yeah. <laughs> now, why did you guys leave the show? Well, I left because, first of all, I was married. I had a kid at home. Um, I had just gotten off the Miller Band, and I had spent enough time on the road. Yep. Plus, Roy was getting – he was becoming a different person. It was and, getting a little weird. Yeah, he was getting a little weird. And uh, it wasn't quite as fun as what it had been. So uh, I had moved into a new house. As a matter of fact, Tim and a bunch of guys from the band came up and helped me move that time. Remember that, Tim? Oh, yeah. And uh, I've been, I'm still in the same house we moved into way back then. <laughs> yeah, that was 50 years ago, Tim. I know. Holy cow. Frightening thought. Yeah, and Tim, kind of a similar situation for you leaving the shows. Uh, Roy and I had a contract conflict, and okay. it was it was time for me to leave. Yeah, and I ended up 
going back to going to LA mm-hmm. and was working with Donald O'Connor at that point anyway. So right. it was a good move. It was a good time. Yeah. Um, and then these shows, uh, and look what you guys missed. You could have been with Jack Carter again in 1979. Oh, <laughs> Ink Spots. That was a good group. I Ink like Spots were Spots. fun. Yeah. 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 They Ink were Spots. on earlier. Yeah. And you know, how... we didn't, you know who we didn't talk about was Pat Suzuki. Yeah. That, Remember Pat Suzuki. Suzuki from Flower Drum Song? Yeah. 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 She was adorable. She was one of the sweetest people. Yeah, I saw that uh, Pat Suzuki showed up in some of the earlier ones. Uh, and we yeah. also have Johnny Ray here, who you mentioned briefly before. Um, and he was a real crowd pleaser, right? Oh, absolutely. He killed oh, him. Indeed. Uh, <clears throat> wait, no, that's... Uh, I had another picture of... Oh, here we go. This is Johnny, is, yep. right? Yeah. So he yeah. would do his whole uh, cry, his uh, cry oh, yeah. song and do the whole drama, the dramatic... Walking in the rain, all that stuff. Yep. 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 Early on, we had a uh, um, an MC before Milton Berle, yep. and I'm trying to think of what his name was. You remember Tim, guy with the long hair? No. Oh man, I can't think of his name, but he was a funny, funny guy. But uh, again, he, he never quite made it because uh, he too was uh, uh, a little bit of a lush. Yeah. But yeah. He had hair. That he would comb and. Oh, Charlie Gaston. Who? Now I know who you're talking about. Charlie Gaston. Charlie Gaston. That's right. His name was Charlie he Gaston. Was. He was a local guy from Boston. Yeah. And he had blonde hair, skinny guy, uh, glasses, drawn face. Great MC. Good yeah. MC. Yeah. <laughs> and he was also a comedian. So Johnny would come out and do his act, and then a couple other people would come out and do their act. And then it'd be time for uh, Charlie Gaston to come out and do his act. Well, he used to do these impersonations of Sinatra and yeah. and uh, um, uh, the guy that just passed away, uh, not Perry Como, Tony Bennett. Tony Bennett. Ah. And also of Johnny Ray. Hmm. Well, Every night he had a different shirt on. Comes out in a tuxedo and he begins to sing whatever the tune was. And he'd break in to cry and he'd start taking his tuxedo top off and let your head on it. He'd grab himself because of the tune at the time. And he'd rip the shirt right off his back. He had little slits in the back of it. He'd just rip it right down. So the only thing that was holding the shirt on were the cuffs. He never unbuttoned the cuffs. And so he's standing there with his shirt in front of him. And now he said, I let your hair down. And he fluffs up his hair. Well, his hair was, I can't see what I'm doing here. His hair was way out to, to here. Looked like <laughs> Bose on a clown. And he was bald on top. But you never knew that beforehand. You just thought he had a funny wig on. And it was, it sounded, it was a dead ringer for Johnny Ray when he would sing yeah. this song. Wow. And, yeah. One of the funniest things I ever saw. It yeah, Charlie, Charlie Gaston shows up on a lot of these programs, but, it, it, you know, it, he didn't have, uh, uh, it seems, much of a presence, like, outside of, you know, like like you said, I guess he never really hit that status that some of these other guys hit. No. He had every opportunity. He was on the Mike Douglas show and a few other uh, talk shows, yep. but he always went in half, half in a bag, and uh, so nobody would touch him. Um, one of these, uh, one of the um, comments says that wasn't Johnny Ray mostly deaf? Was that hard for him to sing with the music behind him? He was deaf. Uh, he had a hearing aid, and uh, we had a panic one day. He was getting on the bus just before the show, and he slipped and fell, and shattered his hearing aid. He had one of those little boxes, looks oh, like wow. a transistor radio. Yep, it was all over the floor of the bus. And now we got to do a show with a guy who's not going to be able to hear us. <laughs> Fortunately, his manager, his road manager, opened up a bag that he always carried, and there were about 15 of them in there. Wow. So he just pulled another one, plugged it in, put it back in his jacket, and took <laughs> him back out. I, I've i included some of these. Uh, there have been some of these old uh, clippings from the National Enquirer and 
And, you know, this was Johnny Ray years earlier, probably the late 1950s, saying I'm all washed up. And um, but these shows were really an opportunity for these guys that really, you know, thought maybe it was all over by the late 50s or, or 1960s. And they were able to do their thing and really keep performing. Yeah, Roy did a great job putting this together. Mm-hmm. And he was actually fabulous for them to give them a chance to get out and really show what they could do. But also for us young musicians who were just getting started, it was the greatest education in the world. All right. Yep. I mean, we, we all learned so much and grew so incredibly over the years on that show. Uh, this was um, this was also around this time, 79. Um, I was surprised to see this as a Tiny Tim fan, that Miss Vicky joined uh, the 79 tour. <laughs> I'm glad I was gone. <laughs> yeah, that's really surprising that she did that because um, they did not... Um, they did not get along. No, a lot of issues. Um, yeah. Oh, in uh, fact, we were driving, not to interrupt you, but we were driving <laughs> down around New Jersey... And there was a big billboard and it said Tiny Tim's Miss Vicky performing tonight. And it was a, a list of dates and it was a strip joint. She was a stripper. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Were you, were you, um, were you actually with Tiny when you yeah. saw that? Yeah. He was the one that spotted it and said, Oh my God. And looked out. And so we're all looking out to see what he's talking about. Wow. And we all felt really bad for him. Yeah, I can't imagine he was happy because she also did a um, a photo shoot in uh, an adult magazine. Was it We maybe that uh, and she was uh, holding a photo of Tiny in a frame uh, uh, naked. And yeah, so uh, I'm very surprising that they went on tour together. But I guess, uh, you know, the money, the money talked. (laughs) I guess so. Uh, Maury Amsterdam. So uh, I couldn't find a, a year that he appeared on a show, but I did find this from one of the programs. Um, you guys worked with him, right? Oh, yeah, he was yeah. great. <clears throat> and uh, any uh, memories? Uh, Greg, um, there was something, Tim, where he took you, uh, you and Greg Zach to the White House? Yeah. Yeah, I got a call one morning. We were we had a late call. We didn't have to get on the bus till like two in the afternoon. And Maury called and said, hey, Tim, uh, you want to go to the White House? And I said, what's up? And he says, well, you know, we're going to go meet with Jerry, Jerry Ford. (laughs) And I said, yeah, that'd be great. He said, yeah, get a couple of guys and let's go. So I called Greg Zach. Oh, no, Greg Zach and I were rooming it together at that point. And uh, I said, hey, we're going with Maury to the White House. We called a couple other guys. And only one of them wanted to get up because <laughs> so, it was a little early. So we went to the White House and went in. They took us in through the press room in the West Wing and down the hall and into the Oval Office and just left us there for a while. And all of a sudden, I guess Jerry Ford come down. He was watching a, a college football game. <laughs> and he had his sweatshirt, his team sweatshirt on and just came down and said, sorry, guys, it was an exciting game. And just said hi and took a couple of and disappeared. <laughs> and he was he was gone again. But wow. it was it was an experience to be able to sit there in the White House in the in the Oval Office. <laughs> it was nice of Maury to bring you along. Very. <clears throat> and, um, this again, I mean, we're getting into the late shows here. This is 1980. Um, new appearances. I think these were new. Pat Paulson, uh, George Savalas. Um, and then uh, 81, this was the year again that I went. Um, I, I think, uh, um, oh, there's another picture of Tiny. Uh, so these were both, uh, you can see on the bottom, uh, Roy Radin, um, you know, I, he was managing Tiny for some of the years. Um, uh, and what else? And this, oh, this is 82. Uh, this might be the last one that I have. Um, so this was uh, Joey Bishop, um, who kind of infamously um, got into it with uh, Roy, claiming that uh, Roy didn't make good on a payment. He was supposed to be getting $10,000 a week to do these shows. Um, and uh, I, do you guys know like what 
kind of money these these acts were making? Was ten thousand a week much higher than anything you had ever heard? No, uh, I don't remember what Eddie Fisher was making or Donald O'Connor, uh, but I would imagine that would be at least what they made. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I I sat in the audience one one night setting up, watching them set up the show with Burl. And uh, Kenny Sherburn was on stage doing his unicycle. And I'm sitting next to, um, uh, I forgot his name now. Tim, you, you remember. He was uh, uh, Milton Burrow's valet. Paul Dapplemere. Paul. I was sitting next to Paul. And Burrow was sitting on the other side of me. And... Uh, I said, now there's something I wish I was able to do, watching Kenny go across the stage on this unicycle. And Milton says, well, I can do that. <laughs> I said, yeah, sure you can. He <laughs> says, I'll tell you what. He says, I'll bet my $17,000 a week salary against yours. Well, wow. mine was 250 bucks. Yep. So I'm thinking about it, and he was smart enough to get up and walk away before I had a chance to answer. <laughs> Paul leans over and says to me, it's a good thing you didn't take the bet. I said, you can ride the unicycle? Oh, yeah, he can ride that unicycle. Don't you worry about that. And he knew you were going to bet him, so he left. <laughs> uh, there's a comment here. Uh, Janice Harper was on this show. Wow, one of the greatest 50s singers, uh, but hardly anyone had heard of her. I love her voice. Um Let's see. And uh, another comment, John Carradine, one of my favorite actors, hard to imagine him in a show. Did he quote Shakespeare? Um, OK, I'm going to take the take the rein on this one because uh, I did see this show. John Carradine, uh, it, the, the night that I went, um, it was mostly youth groups um, in the audience and it wasn't too well attended. Um, and it was a very impatient, sort of boisterous audience. And uh, they had no idea who John Carradine was. Carradine was standing there. He was crippled from arthritis at this point, his hands. Um, and he was reading uh, uh, Edgar Allan Poe. And, uh, and his mic kept going out. So it was a disaster. The crowd was getting really unruly. And, um, and he just felt bad for this old guy standing there, barely walk and... Uh, uh, and at that time, I don't know if they did this with all the shows, if you guys did this, but um, they had the act introduce the next act uh, in a lot of cases. Um, so Carradine finishes his poem after this, you know, he just bombs this disaster. And he said, uh, now, please, let's welcome Zippy the Chimp. And Zippy skates across the stage and the crowd goes insane. They're just thrilled and they're just cheering and clapping and applauding <laughs> and um so afterward uh you know you guys would um the bus would be out in the lot and people that were in the audience could go out and and meet all the talent and they would sign the programs and uh and i remember going back there roy was there with his walking stick you know looking very important and there sitting in the bus was john carradine you know, I could see him just staring straight ahead. And uh, Judd Strunk, one of the other acts, I, I said, oh, is Mr. Carradine going to come out? And he said, no, no, this this really isn't for him, this show. You know, So I'm sure you guys experienced that with other talent. But it, it just was especially awkward for Carradine, given what he was, you know, in the middle of this show where you had Satani Demon and the Harmonica Rascals and Pinky Lee running up and down the you know, it, it just, he just really stuck out as a sore thumb, you know? Yeah. Um, That's too bad. I used to show it's like John Carradine. Yeah. It was a very weird ending for him. You know, um, it, 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 it was definitely not the right place <laughs> for him. Yeah. Um, and uh, so now in this show, and this was the last one I could find, I think this was Joey Bishop. Um, at Bally's and on the uh, bill is Mickey Deans, who you guys mentioned earlier. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now Mickey Deans. So he was a piano player, a decent piano piano player. Great, yeah. great piano yeah. player and, and a great voice. Yeah. And he sounded um, a lot like Sinatra. 
And and as you, I think one of you guys mentioned, this was Judy Garland's last husband. He's actually the one that discovered her body in the hotel. Yep. Um, yep. And um, and then this was him, I guess, on the bus. I think that's yeah. it. Yeah. That's um, me. And uh, so, um, yeah, what's so one of the stories about him that showed up, uh, MJ, am I, I, I guess the, uh, the magician who had done the shows, he had posted on on uh, the Facebook page that he can remember Dean's having a, a vase like full of cocaine on his desk in his office. Um, do, you, do you guys know? Did you ever hear about this or does it surprise you or? I can't say it surprises me, but I never saw it. Yeah, yeah. I didn't either. That was probably when he was working in Roy's office. Right, right. Yeah. Because he left he left conducting and went to work in the office. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um and uh and then this was I mentioned earlier about uh Joey Bishop. So um yeah, he uh Roy Raiden was actually threatened by Joey Bishop for not, you know, uh coming up with the money or, and, uh, this is actually chronicled in that, in that book, uh, bad company that, um, there was a, a kind of a meeting in little Italy where, um, Joey had his guys and Roy had his guys and they, uh, reached an agreement. Um, <laughs> but I'm guessing negotiations you guys did with Roy were a little easier. Yeah. For the most part. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, I mean, like I said, Roy, Roy could be difficult to work with, right? But he was he would generally um, he would generally become fair. You know, it might take a little while, but well, he would come around. Yeah. So I don't know what was going on there. I had uh, already left the show, and I had not much to do with uh, those negotiations with Joey Bishop. No. Yeah, we never had anything to do with that. And this is just very right near the end, the very end, actually. Uh, notice, notice, notice due to the untimely death of Roy Raiden, the vaudeville show originally scheduled for June 22 um, has been postponed. And um, and uh, yeah, and then another story. This was, I think, from Variety 1983 in June, uh, ending the Raiden shows. And um, but. There were memories, and uh, absolutely. <laughs> here are you guys on the bus. Um, I, the guy on the right, was that your driver? No, that was Buddy Freed. That was Buddy Freed. He was, he the, was the original Gordon's conductor. Team. Well, not the original one, but he was uh, uh, conductor when when um, Mickey um, left. What, I'm okay. sorry. With yep. Frank Gorshin. Fra Frank Gorshin, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> And uh, so, yeah, a crammed bus and uh, and lots of uh, miles. But you guys had fun with it. Oh, we had up, up until the point where the where the uh, um, what were they called? What what were all the girls called? The, uh, the gold diggers. The gold diggers came on. It wasn't yeah. that we didn't have fun then, but they had so much luggage we had no place to sit anymore. And yeah, that was the first tour. In fact, if you look at the back of that upper left-hand picture, in the back you see there are three rows just stacked with luggage. Oh yeah, there it is. And we were we were only allowed one piece of luggage per person. Wow. But they had sometimes at that point because they had just come from somewhere else. I think uh, Las Vegas or Tahoe, and had all the luggage for their their show that they were doing. And it was just overwhelming, to say the least. Oh, yeah. They're a fun group, but boy, did they take a lot I'm, of room. I'm still <laughs> friends with most of them. They're just absolutely sweethearts. So you guys were only allowed one bag. Were your suits basically walking by themselves uh, by day 45? No, by day two. Yeah, <laughs> yeah really. <laughs> there was an incident with... Uh, uh, red buttons. We pull into a hotel middle of the night, and uh, we're all tired, and we all just went to bed. And I'm Tim and I are rooming together, and mm. Red comes knocking at the door. Now he's a very fastidious person. He uh, he needed everything just so he would eat by himself. He 
traveled by himself. He did everything by himself, which was okay. He was a good guy. Yeah. He comes knocking at the door, and he has this can of juice in his hands. And he says, uh, guys, he says, I lost my can opener. And Tim says, well, I got one. And Tim has his suitcase sitting there. He throws it up on a bed, unleashes the latches. It springs open like there was a spring in there from all the dirty clothes. <laughs> and Red's just standing there looking at this mess. But he's still standing there. And so Tim goes digging through here, digs through his clothes, and he comes out with his old sock. And at the bottom, he reaches into the bottom of the sock and pulls out a can opener, hands it to Red. And Red just turns and says, thanks, <laughs> no thanks, and goes back to the room. <laughs> <laughs> Not my oh, finest hour, but I had what he wanted. So, <laughs> oh, and uh, now these uh, pictures here—that's Donald O'Connor on the top two pictures, right by the bus. Yep. And yeah, that the one on the left is when we got pulled over by the uh, New York State Troopers for speeding. Ah. And uh, Donald and George Goebel and Georgie Jessel went out and talked to the cop, and he told us to just go <laughs> and. The, the other one with Donald is uh, when one of the wheels started coming off the axle of the bus. <laughs> wow. And there's a uh, there's a question in the chat about uh, ask about Carl, the driver who had a great singing voice. Oh, my God. Yes. Yeah, he did. Carl was incredible. In fact, when we were working, we had, you know, we had uh, Dick Hames and Johnny Ray and all these great singers. Carl came up one night. We we used to when we get to a bar, if there was a band, we'd go in and we'd take over and be playing jazz up there, and then the acts would get up and sing. Yep. And uh, this one night, Carl comes up before everybody else says, "Hey Tim, I want to sing." And I mean, we all started like, "Yeah, yeah, right, Carl, sure, yeah, whatever." He says, "No, really." He says, "You guys know Love for Sale?" We said, "Yeah." He gave us the key. We started in, and he he says make it swing guys and we went all right we take off and this guy could out sing everybody on the show <laughs> he was amazing and we were yeah. floored so none of the other acts would get up that night wow they didn't want to try to follow him he just killed it and you should have seen him on a unicycle yeah really yeah <laughs> <laughs> wow Never and... did that one again <laughs> yeah there's a question here. Considering all the different venues, did the band have any exposure to the mob? Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they were great. Yep. yep. Absolutely, they were. Um, most of us we, treated them. Most of them treated us well. Yeah. 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 We were in uh, Pennsylvania, in the upstate New York area. We were in Pennsylvania, and, and uh, Frankie Fontaine comes knocking at our door. He says, you guys want to go for, uh, it's a Sunday. You guys want to go for uh, dinner? Sure. So we got a bunch of the guys from the band and whoever else was available, and we just got in the car or whatever and, and went over to this place. Uh, it turned out to be an Italian place. <laughs> they had the table set up in a U-shape. We all sat around the outside of the U, and all these little Italian ladies, there must have been four or five of them, would come and uh, uh, service food all afternoon. It was, it was a mafia place, and they closed the place on Sunday just so that they could give food to the guys in the band and Frankie Fontaine. And, uh, it was, but it was great. They were always, always very nice to the band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, listen, uh, this you guys have been so generous with your time. Uh, I've never had one of these run two hours, but I kind of knew it was going to run long because it, it's such a rich history that uh, that these shows had. And you guys were there for so much of it. And uh, I'm really glad we got a chance to kind of chronicle all this and, and get it all uh, into this show. Is there anything that we haven't addressed. Is there any performer? I'm sure there are many that we've missed, but anybody else come to mind that? No, I think, I think we pretty much covered it. I mean, there's, <laughs> I, we've got stories for weeks 
<laughs> but uh, we won't go into those now. <laughs> there are many but, uh, stories I'm we will to... never tell you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but Rich, I got to thank you because this is the first time I've done one of these where we didn't have to talk about the shady side of Roy yeah. and what happened after yeah. I left with the murder and all that. So they all want to know about that. And that's not what we were all about. We had yeah. a ball. We had an absolute ball. And we learned our craft with this. Yeah. So, and, you know, God bless Roy. He he taught us well. Yeah, the um, you know, it's just it's hard to describe these shows accurately and and it just meant so much to me seeing this show and it changed the way I looked at like entertainment and it just really um, gelled for me, like what I wanted to do in entertainment. And um, uh, so, yeah, it, I, I wanted to kind of, you know, capture that if as best we could. And, and yes, there is a very dark side to this story, unfortunately, um, that's independent of these shows. So there's some crossover, yeah. but it, it really is a, a whole different story. And that story is out there for those that want to hear it and read about it. And, um, but, uh, but uh, for the years that these shows ran, they were remarkable. And uh, you guys were very fortunate to be, uh, to be a part of it. We had a ball. Yeah, yeah. we did. Absolutely. Well, we made lifelong friends. I mean, Jerry and I have been friends for 50 years. Vinny, our lead opera player, Eddie Sturvis, Tony Tedesco, our drummer, just great, great guys. Yeah. Well, you guys were very lucky, and it was uh, and yeah. so early in your careers too, in your early twenties to hit this. I didn't realize you were that young. Um, so, um, well, thanks again so much, and thank you everyone who uh, stuck with us and had questions in chat and. Um, uh, and uh, if you liked what you see, please make sure you subscribe and like. And um, and guys, I hope uh, there. Are, you say there are more stories to come. We might have to do this again sometime. I'm game if Jerry is, and we <laughs> got to bring Greg Zach this time. Yeah, <laughs> Greg I'd like to see along. Greg here. He's got a lot of stories. Yeah. Thank you, Rich. Appreciate it. All right, guys. Thanks again. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye bye. Take